you know, the thing about life is that our decisions are critically important. And the people that are getting baptized today have made a significant, important, critical decision to, to surrender themselves to the Lord afresh and to start again, to start anew, to be born again and to have a new life filled with the power and the presence of God, overcoming temptation, getting free from addictions, getting healed, not doing it alone anymore, but doing it with God. I've decided, I've decided to make a change, to surrender themselves and start afresh. I want to talk a little briefly about two paths. Jesus said in Matthew 7 verses 13 to 14, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and only a few find it. See, there's two paths in the Bible. One leads to life, but one leads to destruction. Which path will you choose in life? The thing about the path is it's not about your opinions, and it's not about your beliefs. It's about your decisions. It's about the choices you make. And it's the choices that we make every day that pave the path. There are paving stones that we walk on. The paving stones that we walk on is the fruit of our past decisions. We're walking that path now. But importantly, there's hope. Because tomorrow, we will walk the fruit of today's decisions. And so today's decisions matter. Because we will walk in the path that we laid for ourselves tomorrow. The path that God is calling every single one of us on is the path that leads to life, the narrow path. It's easy to live a way that leads to destruction. It's easy. But it can be difficult to live and walk the path that leads to life. Proverbs 14 verses 12 says this, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Some versions say, appears to a man in his own eyes that this is the way to go, but it leads to death. How do we, how do we know that we're on the right path in life if there's a path that seems to be right but leads to death? If there's deception... How do we know we're on the right path? How do we know we're making the right decisions? The Bible says that we need a guide, that we need a teacher. We need someone to guide us along the path of life and to instruct us in our decision making, to instruct us in the steps that we take in our everyday life. One day we might think, I'm going to do this, and we need our guide, our guide to say, no, don't do that. Psalm 27 verse 11 says this, Teach me how to live, O Lord. Lead me along the right path, for my enemies are waiting for me. You've got an enemy that wants to pull you off the right path. He wants to deceive you. He wants to, make, to influence your decision making so that you take the wrong steps and make the wrong choices. And that would lead you down a path of destruction. But we have a God that wants to lead us if we would allow ourselves to be led. If we would allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit and by the teachings of Jesus, He would lead us every day in our decision-making. We can read the Word, we can pray and be led by the Spirit. Proverbs 2 verse 6 says this, The Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up the sound, sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. To guard the path of justice and protect the way of the, of the saints. Then you will discern righteousness and justice and equity. Every good path. For wisdom, if you keep clicking on it, thank you. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will delight your soul. Discretion will watch over you and understanding will guard you. To deliver you from the way of evil, 
from the man who speaks perversity, from those who leave the straight paths to walk in the ways of darkness, from those who enjoy doing evil and rejoice in the twistedness of evil, whose paths are crooked, whose ways are devious. It will rescue you from the forbidden woman, woman sorry, from the stranger with seductive words, who abandons the partner of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death, and her tracks down to the departed spirits. None who go to her return to negoti- or, ne- or negotiate the paths of life. Verse 20. <clears throat> so you will follow in the ways of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will inhabit the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the unfaithful will be uprooted. See, the story of the Bible starts off in a garden. There's a is a beautiful garden, and the garden is a place where heaven meets earth. The garden is heaven on earth because it's where God is. God is walking with Adam in the garden. The garden's a perfect place. It's a place of peace. It's a place of safety. It's a place of living and dwelling in the presence of God. It's a, it's a place where there's no death in the garden. There's no death. They'll live forever. It's heaven on earth. And it starts off in this perfect place. But God doesn't want slaves and robots in his garden. He he wants children. And so he gives them free will and he gives them an opportunity to choose a different path. See, if they're going to live in the garden, they're going to be children of the Father. And the Father, this is his house, the house of God. This is the garden of God. And in his house are his rules. And he sets the rules. And there's only really one rule in this beautiful place. It's you can eat of any of the trees, but don't eat of that one tree. There are many, many trees in the garden, many delicious things to eat and great things to do, but just don't do this one thing. But the one tree, the fruit of the tree symbolized independence. It symbolized going your own way. It symbolized departing from following the instructions of God and going your own way, making my own rules being my own judge. Don't judge me. I'm going to make decisions for myself. That is the heart of rebellion, of independence, and it's the path of destruction. So they take the fruit, and interestingly here, it says in Genesis 3, 24, that God drove out the man, and at the east of the garden he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way back the way to the tree of life. So the Bible starts with the story, and it also starts with this picture that there's a a path to the tree of life. There is a way back. And the, the story of the Bible is people trying to make their way back to the tree of life. There's a call that God wants you to make your way back into the garden place, to be in his presence, to live in his presence, to have the life of his presence. The path back to life is the path of living led by the Spirit. The path back to the place of the presence of God is a path of living every day led by the Spirit. Psalm 16, 11 says this, You will show me the way of life. Granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. There is a way. There is a path. It leads back to the presence of God. See, at the start of the Bible is one garden. And at the, other, at the end of the Bible, in the very last few pages, there's another garden. It's slightly different because there's a lot more people to fit into the garden. So it's a garden city. But everything else is the same. It's got the tree of life, it's got the streams of living water, and it's got God dwelling with man, and it's got no more death. So at the beginning and at the end are marked with this perfection, with God's heart for people, that one day 
They will live in his presence. They will walk with him again. And the path in between is the fall, is the struggle of learning to navigate and learning to make our way back to God's presence. I'm going to invite the band up. The path back to God starts with the narrow, the small gate. The small gate. Uh, As the band comes out, I'm going to invite the people getting baptized this morning. You can go and get changed if you need to get some togs on. Just got five minutes now and we'll be baptizing people. See, the pathway back to life, it starts with the little gate, as Jesus talked about. And Jesus was familiar with the pain of going through this narrow gate because he did it himself. He was also in a garden, and the garden was called the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a place of crushing. It's a place where they crushed grapes and created oil. The garden was a place of pain, and the gate that he had to go through was a, as a gate of suffering. Jesus had to surrender his will to God. He had to surrender his future to God because God had a plan for his life that would bless humanity. And do you know that God has a plan for your life and he has a path for your life that will not just bless you, but will bless you, all the people around you, that your life would become a blessing to those around you. It wouldn't just be about yourself. Jesus had a decision to make in the garden. Will I live for myself Or will I surrender my will and my comfort to the will of God so that he can multiply the fruit of my life to be a blessing to others? And this is the small gate. It's the gate of surrender, the moment of surrender where we lay down our rights and our life to God. And we say, God, you know what? I'm going to let you lead me in my decisions and my steps and in my path from now on. I don't want to take the wide, easy path that leads to destruction. I want you to lead me along the narrow way, the narrow way that can be hard to find. But I know that if you lead my everyday steps, I will walk in that way, and I'll find myself led back to the presence of God. Amen. There might be some of you today who God is speaking to, and he's calling you back to his presence. He's calling you to know what it's like to live a life where you're led by the Spirit every day in your decisions. Live a life of light and goodness where you read the Word and where you submit to God and where you let the Spirit lead you. This is what these guys are doing today. They've made a decision. They're saying, you know what? I'm going to lay down my rights. I'm going to lay down my future decisions. I'm going to lay down my life and I'm going to trust God that He's going to lead me. He's going to lead my life to blessing, to goodness, to health, to to, to, to a beautiful life that He can recreate my life. And instead of being a mess, instead of being bitterness and hatred and brokenness, He can lead me to blessing, to reconciliation, to forgiveness, to healing, to love, to peacemaking. He can lead me. And so I'm going to lay myself down at this point and say, God, you lead. You take the wheel. Amen. So we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song together. And I want to invite people this morning. You can stand. We're going to sing a song as these guys get ready for baptism. As we sing this song, I I want to give you an opportunity today to say, you know what, Jesus, I'm, I'm not allowing you to lead right now, but I want to change that. I want to make a decision that I'm going to allow you to lead my life. I'm going to surrender my life to you.